morning, everyone. And we're so happy to have everyone joining us from across uh, the country. And we are going to get started today with today's goals. And the goals for today's presentation are to understand what is needed to use data effectively and responsibly, and to understand the components of creating a data culture. And also, specifically, we'll be focusing on the concept of data literacy for teachers and the extent to which educators can demonstrate data literacy and how to determine that. And as Peter mentioned, the College and Career Readiness Research Alliance of the U.S. Virgin Islands is hosting this event. And the, we have an audience there in person in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we give a special welcome to them. And the goal of the U.S. Virgin Islands College and Career Readiness Research Alliance is really to focus on using data to see how we can help prevent and reduce the number of students dropping out in the territory. So how to establish early warning systems and how also to identify and implement interventions to help improve outcomes for students who may be at risk for dropping out. These are the core planning group members of our USVI Research Alliance for Dropout Prevention, uh, or for College and Career Readiness, pardon me. As you can see, we have representation from the U.S. Virgin Islands Govern uh, Governor's Office, from the Board of Education, from the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Education, from the University of the Virgin Islands, from the districts as well. And just to highlight one research study in progress, it's an identification of U.S. Virgin Islands college readiness indicators. So looking at student level data to determine which high school students are on track for enrolling and persisting in post-secondary education. So now we can turn the time over to our featured presenter, who is Dr. Ellen Mandanak. She's a senior research scientist at WestEd. And she will be speaking today about implementing a data literate culture. So we would like to turn the time over to Dr. Mandnack. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everyone. Um, I feel like I'm coming home because uh, I'm New England born and bred from New Hampshire. And uh, I know we have a national audience today. And I'll be in the Virgin Islands in three weeks on a cruise. Uh, and when they invited me to do this, I thought, you know, it's winter in, uh, in the Northeast. Why can't we do this one in person? But I'm very pleased and, and honored to be uh, part of this presentation today. So welcome all. And please feel free to um, send any questions. And the folks from uh, the regional lab will interrupt me. And, uh, and we'll go from there. We have a couple different parts, uh, as, uh, as Claire mentioned. We'll talk about the practice guide. And we'll talk about some of the conceptual work that colleagues at WestEd and I have been doing around a construct called data literacy for teachers. These are essential components uh, of establishing a data culture in your school and your district. So this is a rhetorical question. I, and I really would like you to think about it uh, as we go through the next um, 90 minutes. Do you think you are implementing a data culture in your school? Think about what components are necessary. What are the uh, impediments? What are your challenges? What do you need and from whom to make that data culture happen? I apologize for those who may have heard me speak, but there's a metaphor that I really, really like to use. Uh, and it occurred to me as I was coming home from my first safari and going to a bridge event in Las Vegas. And that's the metaphor of uh, data-driven decision making in, uh, in the safari. I, everyone has talked about that data use is new, but it's not new. It's been around for a very, very long period of time. As I watched the safari trackers look for animals, and we were out looking for rhinoceri and elephants and whatever else, they were using all sorts of data. They were, picking, uh, they were looking at broken uh, branches of trees, trampled grass, hoof prints, and even poop. One, one tracker picked up and said, oh, this is a pregnant female. She just ate this, da, 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 da. And then wanted to shake my hand. It was like, no, no, thank you, no, thank you. But they got a lot of information, valuable information about the animals from those data. And, and when I uh, realized this and presented at the bridge event in Las Vegas, 
a teacher in the back of the room stood up and said, you know, as educators, we're steeped in poop too. Um, that's not to say that educational data is, is that, but it just means that there are many diverse sources of data, and I want you to think out of the box. So I'm going to ask you to take both a high view, a 30,000-foot view, and we're also going to get down into the weeds. And as you'll see, I'll use some graphics that will keep the safari metaphor going. So first of all, what is data-driven decision-making? We've all heard a whole lot about it. And the definition that we used in the uh, IES practice guide that's now five years old, it's hard to believe, is that data-based decision-making, and some people call it data-based, data-driven, data-informed. People generally don't like data-driven because it means that it's getting forced down your throat. But whichever way, data-based data decision-making in education refers to teachers, principals, administrators, systematically collecting and analyzing various types of data, including demographic, administrative, process, perceptual achievement, uh, to make decisions. And I want to stress the importance of the variety of data sources here. For teachers, the, the biggest source of data comes from, um, from tests, from assessments, from student performance data. But there many, are many other sources of data that are really important to get a comprehensive depiction of the student. Uh, and we'll come back to that later on. So why is it important? There are, there's been an emphasis probably for the last decade or so uh, from policymakers. Uh, it comes from the top of the heap at the U.S. Department of Education. It's coming from State Departments of Education. It's coming from superintendents. What has happened, though, uh, in past administrations, and I'm not making a political comment, uh, you've really been using data for accountability and compliance. What's attendance? What's graduation rate? But really now, the idea is to use data to inform about continuous improvement. Continuous improvement about the child, continuous improvement about a classroom, a school, a district. Um, just as you would go to a doctor, and I hate using the medical um, model of, of, uh, or metaphor, you want your teachers, your administrators, to be informed by evidence, hard data, not just anecdotes and gut feelings. That's not to say that experience doesn't count for a teacher. It does. But you want hard data from which to make decisions. It's not a passing fad. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the, the folks at uh, the Institute for Education Sciences that um, funds most of the educational research and funds the regional labs have insisted, uh, and their funding is based on uh, hard evidence. So uh, it's here to stay. But the bottom line of using data, uh, and in education more generally, is to help teachers help all children learn, regardless. Uh, and that's why we're all in education. So the question is, why now? Why has it become so important? Why has the emphasis occurred? It really is about sort of uh, the perfect storm, the positive perfect storm coming together. There are technological solutions uh, that include things like data warehouses, assessment systems, uh, handheld computers, data dashboards that enable uh, a teacher and administrator to bring together data that heretofore was not possible because there's such a large proliferation of uh, diverse data sources. I know my human memory is just overloaded with the amount of data that I have to take in. Those technological solutions can help. A big issue, uh, and to give you an example, the US Department of Education, through the lo statewide longitudinal data system grant program, has funded $618 million of grants uh, for these uh, huge data systems that each state um, has to have, $618 million. Yet very little has been done uh, to improve and build the human capacity to use data. And, and that's what my colleagues at WestEd and I are really trying to do at this point. Professional development and webinars like this go only so far. Our feeling is that it has to even start earlier uh, in colleges of education. And um, we've been working on that um, uh, for the past two years. Uh, and, and also, uh, you know, why now is even if educators know they should become data informed, there are still many challenges. Uh, the research shows that, uh, and Jeff Wayman has done a study uh, in which you know, school districts really want to do this, but there are many impediments. Uh, time is a big one. That people say that data is a four-letter word. Time is the other four-letter word. 
resources, capacity. There are many challenges, uh, but one thing that is for sure, and this comes from um, a resource from uh, uh, University of Toronto of Katz and Earl, that if you think that data-driven decision-making is an isolated event, you're not doing it right. It should be an integrated part of your everyday practice, just like using a computer, uh, pedagogy, whatever, integrated into what you do. So a couple quotes uh, from both the current Secretary of Education and the former Director of IES. These two quotes basically are giving you the high le highest level mandate of saying, you know, using data, using data analysis is really the thing that must happen in education. And when you have policy uh, makers like this making it very clear, then you know, th this is what has to happen. Uh, it, as I said, it's not just a passing fad. They're very serious about it. So uh, as I said, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. Uh, we're just thinking differently about it now. So let me turn to the practice guide. And, and for those of you who may not be familiar with the uh, structure of the practice guides, there are recommendations that are culled from research. We looked at nearly 3,000 pieces of literature uh, and studies, uh, and they were rated based on the What Works Clearinghouse criteria for rigorous education. And very few came out showing um, meeting those criteria, including some of my own, which, which really hurt, and some of the other authors as well. So we had five recommendations, and then there were action steps under each of these recommendations, and also uh, sort of the pitfalls, uh, issues, ro they call them roadblocks. So roadblocks about you know, why you can't do certain things, and then with recommendations based on the literature of how you might uh, circumvent those roadblocks. Four out of the five of these recommendations made intrinsic sense, and they are all about building a culture of data-driven decision-making. The first, a cycle of ongoing uh, instructional improvement, because so much in data-driven decision-making is about uh, inquiry cycles, the iterative nature. Number three, having a clear vision. Number four, uh, creating a culture. And number five, having a data system uh, that is district-wide. The one that sort of stood out as being an outlier is number two, of having students be their own data-driven decision makers. And so much of that comes from the special ed literature. We were somewhat surprised by it, but uh, after reviewing the literature, it, it seemed to make a lot of sense. So as I go through the practice guide, the second one will be dealt with last because it is slightly different. So don't think, oh, wait a minute, she just fo forgot number two. Uh, here is the practice guide uh, URL. Uh, from what Peter said, some people were having difficulty uh, accessing it. Um, you know, feel free to contact the REL or even uh, contact me at uh, emandon at wested.org. I'd be happy to send you the PDF of it if you can't uh, access it. The first recommendation about, um, and um, in no particular order, the cycle of inquiry. Three action steps here about collecting and preparing data, particularly about student learning. The second is about the interpretation uh, of data through the development of hypotheses. And the reason for using hypotheses is that with the proliferation of data, you have so many different data sources, so many different questions. If you don't have uh, a particular question in mind, you're going to be literally drowning in data. So having that hypothesis will help guide you in uh, your examination of the data and the interpretation. And the final part, and again, thinking that this is a cycle, so it keeps going around, uh, is that you, modif you modify your instructions based on the tested hypotheses with the goal of increasing student learning. And there could be other goals about increasing motivation, increasing uh, engagement, uh, increasing attitudes, other sorts of things. But it, it is an iterative cycle uh, that is ongoing. And this is what it looks like. Uh, and I apologize if this is a little fuzzy. Uh, it was the PDF taken right out of the practice guide. But it gives you some sense of the cyclical nature uh, of this process. And many others have different uh, cycles of, of data and query. We have one. Uh, Barbara Means at uh, SRI has one. Uh, there are a number of people who have uh, generated slightly different ones with uh, slightly different skills. But the whole idea is about starting with a question, collecting data, uh, taking action, analyzing those data, and coming back around to see what more you need to do. 
Okay, skipping recommendation three and going to the vision. I can't stress enough the importance of having a clear vision. Uh, the clear vision uh, coming from the superintendent, coming from uh, building level administrators, having, uh, and part of that is having it consistent with your educational objectives, making it explicit so people know why they're using data. So in order to do that, uh, you need things like having a data team that can set the tone for using data uh, use. These may be a group of uh, teachers who are really data wonks and are very interested in helping others in the school. Uh, part of it is defining what critical concepts uh, for teaching and learning are necessary. And again, those should be tied to your, uh, your school improvement plan, your educational objectives. Uh, having a written plan that uh, specifies what activities need to be undertaken, who's taking what role, what responsibility they have, and having ongoing data leadership. And the ongoing data leadership, and I'll get to that uh, more in the next recommendation, is about having distributed leadership because in m many schools uh, and districts around the country, um, there is great mobility among educators. So you don't want your one uh, data nerd, data wonk, data facilitator uh, to up and leave and then you're, you're pretty much left in the lurch. You want that distributed among your educators so that more and more people become data literate. So, okay, now we're going to move to some polls uh, to, to get you all um, uh, actionable. Uh, we have three polls. Does your district have an explicit vision for data use? Yes, no. Uh, is that vision consistent throughout the district? And is the vision aligned with school and district educational objectives? Can't wait to see what you're going to say. So the numbers are coming in. Uh, the one that stands out to me is, uh, is the vision consistent throughout the district where people, a majority, vast majority are saying that it's inconsistent. And that's a real issue because if your principals are doing something different than your superintendent, uh, that's a real issue. You really need to get them aligned. Does your district have an explicit vision? Uh, over half of people are saying, no, you don't. So why are you using data? Y your teachers are going to say, why am I doing this? And, and for what purpose? You really need that vision. Um, and is it aligned to the educational objectives? Okay, that, one, that one's more positive. Uh, we've got uh, well over half of the people saying that, yes, for the most part. So I think the... The, um, the takeaway message uh, on this is explicitness, consistency, and alignment are really, really important. Um, back to the presentation now, and I'll, we'll get you involved in uh, some more polls going forward. Uh, the fourth recommendation is about enculturation. Uh, and what you need, as I said, is a data facilitator, uh, a data coach, a data leader, whatever you want to call it. Someone who can lead teacher teams in the examination of data. Um, and again, distributed leadership is better. It's not necessarily, uh, and it's not a great idea to make that the principal, because you really want the teachers, whether it's in a grade level team, content level team to have frank discussions. Uh, you, you want people to have open discussions where there's no retribution for saying, you know, I'm really struggling to help Ellen understand fractions. And then it comes back in a teacher evaluation process and you get hammered by that. You want to be able to say, I need help because this student is really struggling. Can somebody help me who may have had him or her the year before? So. Um, Having the structured time for such collaboration, and I know in some districts that's hard because of you know, union regulations and collaborative bargaining and all of that. Uh, an example is Tucson Unified School District has no classes on Wednesday afternoons. They call it the Wednesday outs, where they use that for professional development and data teams to get together to discuss data. Um, and having professional development on a regular and ongoing basis. 
Uh, Barbara Means and, at SRI uh, did a study, and you know, one of the key findings from her is about the consistency, the ongoing nature of professional development. One-time shots and one-time offs are very difficult to sustain, uh, and having the help from something like the data teams and the data facilitator really uh, helps to enculturate data. The most pervasive finding in the literature is about the importance of the building leadership. Uh, as Jeff Wayman has said, uh, data use really lives and dies in the principal's office. Uh, he did a study uh, two years ago uh, where he identified uh, a number of strategies that a principal can use to help facilitate uh, the use of data. Uh, there are a number of them about what questions should be asked, having a data system to support, the distributed leadership, uh, providing personal learning opportunities for the faculty, being able to communicate about data, uh, setting goals for the principal to model data use. So when he or she uh, gives a presentation or talks to a, uh, a parent or a faculty member, modeling data use, providing the structured time to use data. All of these strategies, and, it, it, and the, the Wayman paper is very good, highly recommend uh, it as a good read, uh, will help you to understand what a building leader can do uh, to facilitate uh, his or her faculty uh, using data. More things, you know, and again, the model of data use, the communication of the importance of data through that explicit vision. Um, I've seen instances where teachers have done an end around a principal who, uh, for frankly, is a Luddite, a non-believer in data. It's harder if the, uh, if the principal is not on board um, because you know, it really trickles down to the teachers to understand why it's important. Again, the provision for relief time, having data coaches, the data team, having, and as I said before, having that open and trusting environment in which educators can explore data without the retribution of uh, something coming back in an evaluation um, for being honest about struggling with data or struggling with a student. So it's not, it, it's important to have a data coach. The data leadership is important. Uh, you, one thing, again, about the data uh, the coach is that you don't want to overload that individual. We have seen instances where it is the go-to person, where maybe the data system is so complex, and this is becoming uh, less and less uh, an issue, that maybe it's the, uh, the assistant principal who's the data wonk, and that individual gets bombarded with questions where you really should have the teachers being able to look at and analyze their own data. So distributing uh, that importance and having many people who have the capacity to be a data coach. They don't have to be a statistician. They don't have to be a psychometrician. But somebody who, and this is important, understands not only the data, but understands the domain of, uh, of interest as well as the pedagogical ramifications so that you can combine those three aspects into determining, now that I've got these data, what the heck am I going to do to make a difference either instructionally or through administrative um, decisions. And the data team, getting people together on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, it can be, it, it takes many forms. You can be you know, all the second grade teachers in uh, an elementary school getting together. It could be at the high school level, all of the, uh, the algebra teachers getting together. It, they can be vertical, they can be horizontal, whatever makes sense in your school to have discussions, frank discussions around uh, data. And a question might be, you know, what happens if I'm not in a tested um, uh, content area? So say um, art or physical education or social studies where you don't have your mathematics or your language arts. Uh, to, you know, there are many ways to do this. Uh, you know, I've seen art teachers come up with rubrics and discussions on, uh, on how to use data. Uh, there are very effective ways of doing that. So next polls for everybody to get them, uh, up, get you back into it. Do you have a leadership around um, data? Do you have a data coach or facilitator? Do you have a data team in your uh, school or district?
So it's looking good that there's some level of leadership. Uh, most, well, over 50% have in most or in some schools uh, data coaches. And a little over a third people uh, do have data, well, um, you know, close to 70% have at least some data teams. So that, that's promising. That's a start. And again, uh, I, to really stress uh, long and hard that the data coach really is a key uh, individual in helping to use data as well as the data teams. And the principal, uh, you know, without that individual's leadership really, really um, makes a difference. Okay, moving on here. Okay, um, the work that uh, we have been doing uh, at WestEd, and you may say, you know, what is this thing about data literacy? What is it? And until recently, people were, were there, there were many discussions, but nobody really had a good definition. The Data Quality Campaign, uh, which is a, um, a bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, non uh, advocacy organization in Washington, came up with a sound bite of definition. Uh, we used the one that we developed uh, from our research, which is more cognitively oriented. We're saying that this construct that is being developed is the ability to transform information into actionable instructional knowledge and practices by collecting, analyzing, and interpreting all types of data that include assessment, school climate, behavioral snapshot, longitudinal moment to moment, I could go on on that to help determine instructional steps. And we could say for an administrator, uh, administrative steps. It combines an understanding of data with standards, disciplinary knowledge and practices, curricular knowledge, pedagogical content knowledge, and an understanding of how children learn. Now, there are a couple key factors in this definition. As I said before, many sources of data, not just uh, student performance data, uh, and really the combination of not just the data analytic uh, uh, portion of it, but domain knowledge as well as pedagogical content knowledge. Anyone can be um, you know, a half-baked statistician and have the numbers, but you need at least some level of disciplinary knowledge, domain knowledge, to be able to look at, say, the learning trajectories in mathematics or sciences to know where a student is and what needs to be done, and then the pedagogical knowledge of saying, okay, I've got these numbers, I've got the domain, what do I do with it instructionally, and how do I make uh, instructional actions to uh, improve my, my children's learning? That's really the key. So the conceptual framework, and I hope you can all see this, uh, it gets a little bit fuzzy. You know, at the top, what we have is um, the construct, data literacy for teachers. And as I've said, it really, uh, under the second level, you've got those three components, the content knowledge, the pedagog pedagogical content knowledge, and the data use for teaching, and they do interact. And under that, we have components, uh, six of them, and then we've identified 59 skills and knowledge. The components are how to identify a problem of practice, how to frame a question, and the, you know, when I talked about hypotheses before, uh, being able to develop a hypothesis is, is part of that how to use data, and that's really a catch-all for analyzing data, modifying data, uh, understanding the difference between qualitative and quantitative. Many different skills fall under uh, that category. How to transform the data into information. Data are just, and, and I'll say, well, both qualitative and quantitative, they are just numbers until you provide a context into which to examine um, those data. And that becomes information. Finally, to transform the information into a decision through actionable steps. And finally, to evaluate the outcomes and determine, and keeping in mind that we have this inquiry cycle that I've referred to a number of times, to cycle back and say, wait a minute, do I need to realign my, my question, identify a different part of the problem, uh, focus more specifically on some part, 
go back and collect more data, uh, so on and so forth. So those six components are really key uh, with many uh, sort, uh, different uh, skills and knowledge. And in this um, uh, depiction, we have some of the 59 skills and knowledge. And you can see that you have the circle in the middle. It is the inquiry cycle with the identifying problem, framing the question, using the data, the transformation, and ultimately to the evaluation uh, and outcome with many different skills. And happy to send you um, the theoretical paper uh, and the, uh, the empirical paper on which uh, this work is done. There's a special issue with Teachers College Record uh, coming out uh, in May where uh, two papers uh, will appear as well as some really other uh, important and, uh, and trend-setting uh, studies on, uh, on data, including one by uh, Candace Bacala, who I believe is lucky enough to be sitting in the room in, uh, in the Virgin Islands. Uh, she has a piece um, about her work. Uh, so uh, look out for that in May. So a couple important distinctions here. And, and this, this is really, really important. And I, I want you to think uh, long and hard about this. Do you think that data literacy and assessment literacy are the same thing, or are they different? When we pulled together uh, a group of 55 experts a couple years ago, the outcome of that was the determination that people feel that assessment literacy is a component of data literacy, that they are two different constructs, but assessment literacy subsumed within data literacy. Now, if you think about that, as I said much earlier in uh, the, the bridge event, that the, by far the, the most frequent source of data that teachers will use are assessments of student performance. But those are only one source of data among others. You know, an, an example uh, to give, and th this comes from uh, the Using Data Project uh, at Turk in Cambridge, Mass. Um, there was a rural school district in which uh, a group of students were really struggling. People wondered why these particular students, they looked at the student assessment data, they looked at student performance data, they couldn't figure it out, and then somebody started thinking out of the box. What other sources of data might inform uh, to try and understand why these kids are, doing, are really struggling? And what they found was that the kids who were on school buses the longest were those who were struggling the most. Whoever thought, think about transportation data when looking at students struggling on, uh, on, on learning um, concepts. But indeed, the kids who were on the bus the longest were those struggling, and it enabled them to rethink the transportation schedule uh, to redefine that to try and minimize the amount of commute that uh, the students had, and it worked. So this is to say that data literacy is looking at all sorts of sources of data, not just assessment literacy. And I have to say, uh, I was a bit frustrated a couple weeks ago. I was part of an expert panel on data literacy and assessment literacy at the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards. And th this was about constructing uh, the new assessments for what would be for certifying a board certified teacher. And I lost the battle because there was an assessment expert there who kept on saying, no, we have everything was assessment data, assessment data, assessment data. They didn't want to think past that. Let me impress upon you the importance of thinking comprehensively about your children, about getting the full picture of them. Now, one school district actually took this seriously about the transportation schedule, uh, and this hit the front page of the New York Times. Vail, uh, Arizona, uh, their kids had long commutes. They put Wi-Fi on the school buses. And you go, think about, you put a bunch of kids on a school bus. There are intended consequences and unintended consequences. One would have hoped that putting Wi-Fi on would have enabled the children to do some of their homework, do their assignments and things like that. No, what happened was that the behavioral transgressions uh, went way down because the kids were surfing the web doing whatever kids do, uh, and the school bus driver didn't have to uh, deal with kids acting out. So sort of be careful about you know, how you use it, but here's an example where they actually did use um, different kinds of data to make decisions. So another set of polls for you. Uh, actually, here they come. Four different questions for you. Do you think that your educators in your school district are data literate based on the definition that I've given? 
Does your district provide the needed professional development uh, related to data use? And I'm talking about data use here. Uh, do you think that uh, assessment literacy and data literacy distinction makes sense for you? And do you think that the skills and the conceptual framework makes sense in terms of the reality of your practice? I know there were a lot of questions to give to you uh, in a short period of time, but think about those. This is Claire hopping in here and just wanting to bring attention to the responses of the USBI in-person um, group. And that is showing up right there below the poll. They aren't able to actually enter directly into the poll. So just noting their responses there below. Got it. And we've also had a couple of questions pop up in the chat box, Ellen, if you might want to pause following the poll results to address a couple of, of comments. Sounds great. OK, so looking at the poll, do you think that educators are data literate, some of them? Uh, and I guess the question would be, should everyone be data literate? And one of the things that we're trying to do now, uh, and uh, we have a proposal in, uh, because many schools of education, and we, we've done um, a, uh, a rigorous stu uh, study through a, a survey of schools of education across the United States, colleges of education think that they're training people on data use. It's really assessment literacy, not data literacy. Uh, and what they're doing is not so good. So what we're hoping to be able to do is develop modular materials to help colleges of education, because some will say, you know, we don't have anybody who can teach it. We have no room in the, uh, in, uh, we have no wriggle room in the curriculum. We need help. So we're trying to help because we know that the good PD providers, like uh, DataWise that, uh, uh, that Canvas was associated with, or using data, can only do so much. So does your district provide professional development? Uh, it's for other priorities. Over half of the people say over half priorities. Uh, do, does the conceptual framework uh, make sense? Uh, yes for framing questions. Uh, so it's, that's sort of all over the place. And finally, uh, I'm glad to hear uh, almost everyone is saying that the, uh, the distinction between assessment uh, literacy and data literacy so makes sense. So you guys are in the trenches. I'm really glad to hear that. So th thank you. OK, so let's do some of the questions. And, and you know, we know where the Virgin Islands Not enough PD. So questions, um, you, you want to throw them at me, and I'll try and answer them, or or maybe even get uh, try try and get something from Candace, who's also been at this for a bit. Sure. Um, we have a comment here that I'll just read to you. It says, I think it makes more sense to think of data literacy and assessment literacy as overlapping, not as assessment literacy as a part of data literacy. One could be data literate but not have the skills to develop select appropriate assessments, for example. Um, that, that is true. They are overlapping. Uh, but the way, uh, and again, uh, for uh, the person who asked that question, I'm happy to uh, send the um, uh, one of the white papers that, uh, that generated this, uh, our experts really felt they were somewhat overlapping but really embedded, that part of being data literate is understanding differences in assessment. So you know, what's the difference between a formative assessment and a summative assessment? What's the difference between qualitative and quantitative? Even things, simple things, well, not so simple things, but basic psychometric properties like understanding reliability, validity, um, error of measurement, uh, knowing how to design um, an instrument. So yes, uh, absolutely overlapping, uh, but we, we do believe that pretty much all of assessment literacy uh, can be considered part of being data literate. Great, thanks. And then we just have another general comment um, that it would be appreciated if there could be concrete examples provided, or additional concrete examples? Uh, concrete examples of? Um, I believe of the way that these principles are implemented in schools. Um, but everyone who is participating, please um, provide additional questions or comments in chat if we aren't hitting um, all of the points that you're, that you're hoping that we'll hit. 
And I think that's about it for now. We can continue, Ellen, but um, do please continue to um, put your questions and comments into chat, and we'll break in and get those answered periodically. Okay. Well, well let, let me try, uh, even though I don't know what the uh, examples of uh, is, but you know, for example, with principals, um, we did a study of six schools in one very large district. And what the school did was set us up with, um, and, and we were blind to this, a principal who really didn't understand data and a principal who did at both the, ele at the elementary, the middle school, and the high school level to determine uh, what sort of differences uh, occurred uh, throughout uh, their school based on you know, their ability to use data. And it was striking how different it was you know, the enga engaging parents in discussions uh, around um, student performance, modeling the data use. Um, in, in one school, the principal was, was so anti-data and anti-technology that the faculty basically said, well, you know, if our principal's not doing it, then why should we? They were taking their cues from their building leadership. So that component of leadership, uh, as I said before, and, and in Jeff Wayman's work, you know, is very clear about how important it is. Uh, in terms of the data teaming, uh, we, we've seen examples where people have gotten together with you know, certain students that continue to struggle. And teachers will get together and have conversations about, you know, I've got student X that I've tried every possible uh, instructional intervention, and I'm still not getting to that student. And then uh, the teacher from the prior year said, you know, I had the same thing with, the prob with that particular student, and here's what I did, and here's what finally made a difference with that student. So those kinds of open discussions through data teaming and, uh, and data leadership uh, are made possible. But again, you need the provision for the, uh, the common uh, planning time, the meeting time, uh, the resources, uh, and having that culture of being able to you know, lay it on the line saying, you know, I'm doing well with a student, I'm having a problem with a student, uh, those kinds of open discussions through data teaming and data, um, uh, data leadership. So I hope those kinds of examples help. And you know, if, if you have specific questions of other kinds of examples that you might want uh, me to try and address, please let us know, and, and I'll try and uh, uh, address them. Does that Thanks, make sense? Ellen. Yep, thank you so much. It looks like John Craig is looking for an example of how a strategic plan looks at data use in terms of implementation. What does it look like and how does it evolve? Wait a minute, Can you repeat that if you could, please. An example of how a strategic plan looks at data use in terms of implementation. What does it look like and how does it evolve? OK, um, you know, in a school, most schools have um, school improvement plans. And that becomes sort of the, uh, the framework, the guidelines for a school. To, they know what the goal is, the, the distal goal. Having uh, proximal steps toward reaching that distal goal uh, is really important to lay out what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what data may inform um, those proximal steps toward your distal goal, if your distal goal is you know, improving performance by X percent or helping to move certain students uh, who are struggling or whatever it might be. So laying out the step-by-step uh, the -step action and aligning the data sources to that plan uh, in a strategic way and saying, wait a minute, are there other sources of data, not just the, the logical cast of characters that we're used to examining, like that transportation example, uh, that we may um, examine that may inform what we can do. So uh, I, I hope you know, that, that will address it to some extent. Thank you, Ellen. We have a question from USVI, and they say, we struggle with the time issue. When you're trying to deliver professional development to teachers, what is the best strategy to have enough time logistically? Well, you know, as, as the poll said, there are other competing priorities. People still don't recognize, uh, to some extent, that, um, that data, uh, data use is a generic tool that crosses all, all content areas. So what may happen in the school district with limited resources is that they say, wait a minute, we've got a new math curriculum, or we need PD on something else, or special ed, or whatever, and they use those resources elsewhere. 
the use of data really crosses all content areas, all grade levels. Uh, in my opinion and those uh, in the area of data use, you know, it really um, is a generic tool that should be in every educator's repertoire. So in, in, in terms of, of time, and I, I, can't, you know, I, I don't want to uh, minimize the, because teacher's time is at a premium. Uh, having PD, like uh, the example I gave uh, in Tucson Unified, where they have a set time within the academic calendar to do PD uh, on a continuous basis, uh, on an as-needed basis, um, around the topic of how to use data use is ideal uh, because it is ongoing. There's also the, uh, the just-in-time uh, professional development because you know, if, if you get trained on a data system and uh, during the summer, and then you don't get to use that data system until a couple months afterwards, you're going to forget about it and you're going to need help. Uh, and, and whether that help is through the data facilitator, the data team, whomever, um, you really need uh, help when it's necessary. So uh, one of the things that was found in the, um, in the practice guide was making sure that you align your needs, not just going out and getting sort of canned professional development that is not aligned to your specific needs, but making sure that if you are going out and, uh, and um, hiring on a professional development provider, um, such as DataWise or using data or um, you know, others that are out in the field, that they can customize in a way that meets the needs of your school district and your school uh, and do it in a timely manner so that because recognizing that teacher's time is a premium and there isn't much of it. Um, I, I hope that addresses uh, the question. Thank you, Ellen. Um, we'll take a couple more questions and then get back to the main presentation. Uh, Carol has a comment. Sounds like what you are calling data teams is the current role of PLC groups, where we get together in grade spans and ask the question, what do we want them to learn? How do we know they got it? What do we owe? What do we do if they didn't get it? And what will they be learning next? Carol, you're absolutely on target. Um, you know, it, it, it's called a, a bunch of different things, whether it's PLCs uh, or data teams. Um, they're basically one and the same. Great. And then we have a couple of questions from our in-person audience in U.S. Virgin Islands. Do you have recommendations for using qualitative data systematically for instruction? Actually, that, that's a great segue to something that I'll get to uh, in, a, in a little bit. Because data systems, uh, you know, particularly the local data systems, may uh, be able to take the more local data, and obviously the bigger data systems, it's harder to get uh, the classroom level data. Everyone forgets about the qualitative data, and you know, it's really, really important. When it comes to the qualitative uh, data, um, th a lot of it is about impressions, about what comes through the formative assessment process. And those are really, really important. Um, a lot of it is in note taking of, of recording observations, um, those sorts of things. And there are uh, data, well, there are data supports, uh, technological supports that can be used for that. But you know, as I said, that data driven decision making is uh, is not new. I maintain that good teachers have been doing data driven decision making for the longest time. It's just that the proliferation of data has uh, far surpassed the memory capacity um, of, of a human being. These are the sorts of qualitative data that a teacher uh, observes in the classroom all the time. Uh, a student falling asleep, a student less than engaged, uh, you know, someone in defensive um, uh, posture. Those are the sorts of data. And again, you know, how do you do that in a class of anywhere from 20 to 35 children uh, and make sure that you note it because, again, you know, it's the memory capacity of uh, someone's uh, brain. So, you know, really what I would, would stress is that you have a good, um, either a dashboard or um, a note-taking uh, facility where you can note what's happening with all of your children and then uh, combining those, aligning those with the, um, uh, with the quantitative data uh, that, that's coming from other sources of data. Uh, in fact, one of the things we're doing for the Gates Foundation is looking at hybrid uh, personalized learning environments. And even for the quantitative data, 
the sorts of things that are coming from different data systems are not always aligned. So this is something that the field is still working on of how to really pull together so many of the diverse uh, sources of data. I mean, the biggest issue right now is because formative assessment is, uh, is being more and more um, an approved source of data for people, not just uh, the summative, is how those data uh, get entered uh, formally. And there are a couple places, uh, Arkansas for one, uh, that they have set aside in, um, uh, in their state data system for different districts and, and schools to be able to enter these sorts of data as a, source, a data source, a technology source um, that may not be available, particularly in small and rural schools. So that's sort of a long-winded way around saying that uh, taking notes is, is a really good way of handling it, uh, but there are other resources as well, such as dashboards that will enable somebody to um, collect data as they're observing uh, and interacting in their classroom. Thanks, Ellen. Um, Another question from Virgin Islands. How are educator training programs addressing education for new teachers and administrators in this area? That's a great question, and that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we completed a survey last year. I think I mentioned it very briefly. Uh, when we did the survey, um, a nationally representative sample, uh, the vast majority, uh, over 90% of the institutions, said that they were that they had a standalone data course and almost 100% said that they integrate data concepts into existing courses but when we did a deeper dive looking at syllabi uh, it wasn't so much uh, and, and we know that uh, you know syllabi don't reflect uh, exactly what goes on in a course so I think the bottom line is that many institutions don't have anybody who can teach a standalone course um, they, you know, the integration uh, is possible. Right now, we're doing four case studies of, I, I don't want to say exemplary, but uh, emerging institutions around the country. One is a brick and mortar institution, and three are residency programs, so that we will be able to understand what really good programs are doing uh, and extrapolate some of what they're, they've done to be able to uh, give credence to uh, institutions around the country and say, you know, these are sort of scalable things that you may do to be able to train better on the use of data. And a lot of it, uh, for, for those of you uh, who, and this, here's a question to those, uh, and you can put it in the chat. Uh, let us know if you have been, as you have been trained in your uh, undergraduate or graduate program, have you ever taken a data course or really was it an assessment course? Because what we're seeing is people conflating the assessment with the data. And then the question is, who can teach these, even in integration? You've got an existing faculty, and educators uh, in schools of education don't necessarily like to be told what to do and how to change their courses. So the question is, how do we do this in a way that um, can get around some of the uh, challenges of nobody to teach it, no wiggle room in the curriculum? And that's what we're working on right now. Thank you, Ellen. It's, uh, it's about time to move on um, with the, the rest of the presentation, and we will address more questions a bit later. I just wanted to note one comment um, that there needs to be a shift in how we teach and assign teachers, um, Ms. Chambers-Lucas says, and uh, we need dollars for teachers to have fewer classes in a day so that they actually have the time to look at this data and create data plans. Um, just noting all of the uh, demands on teachers' times and the limited time that they, they have to address data. Um, there was also a request um, back with slide 36 about domain of data use for teaching. Um, you mentioned some papers um, that you could perhaps uh, provide links or titles to those so that people can, um, can access those additional resources that you mentioned. Um, and then there was also one more recommendation for a developed, a well-developed model for an elementary school, if you have any resources on that that you could provide? Um, I'll have to think about the last one, uh, and, and maybe Candace and I can uh, can come up with something after the fact. Uh, I've seen, seen it. Uh, I think I've written about it. Uh, it. It's fairly old. In terms of the papers, I'd be more than happy to share them with the REL, and maybe uh, what makes sense is for you to uh, upload them 
with a practice guide or something like that? Uh, is that possible? Yep, I think that we can we can do that for sure. I mean, they they are in press uh, for Teachers College Record right now, uh, so the the versions will be uh, you know sort of the uh, final draft versions that will go into press, not the uh, not what's going to appear. Well, as close as what will appear uh, in in uh, publication uh, in a couple of months. But we'll, I'll try and come up with examples on uh, on the third question on that. So are we are we ready to move forward at this point? Yes, let's or? move forward, and we'll we'll okay. break again uh, later for more questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, all good questions. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, obviously, uh, you know this is an issue, and uh, and everyone is struggling with it. We don't have all the answers, and in fact, um, you know th there's a question that's still looming out there. Somebody asked me about this um, over the weekend, that we still don't have a um, a definitive study that says. If you train teachers to use data, it will uh, it will change their classroom practice in X, Y, and Z ways, and it will improve student performance. There are two studies out there, uh, one from 2011 and one from um, 2013, where they're mixed results, it, and it sort of the answer is it sort of depends. It depends on what class, uh, what content area, depends on what grade level. Sometimes it has an impact, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, one was done at a district level, so we don't have any in, uh, information about what the intervention is. So one of the looming questions out there still is, uh, does data use make a difference in what happens in the classroom and with students? So I think on that one, it's stay tuned. But as you see um, you know, with the slide that's in front of you right now, as you're gathering, this whole process of enculturation requires many stakeholders. It requires um, you know, input from the teachers, from leadership, building leadership, central leadership. Um, it involves the parents, it involves the community, and it involves the students. And that brings to, uh, well, and I'll go to the fifth recommendation before we get to the final one. Uh, the fifth recommendation is about data systems. Originally in 2009 when we um, did this work, there were four sorts of data systems, uh, and again, this comes from uh, work by Jeff Wayman and Sam Stringfield, four different kinds of data systems, uh, data warehouses, student information systems, um, assessment systems, and instructional management systems. And since that time, many other sorts of systems have proliferated, the biggest one being uh, uh, data dashboards that can be done on a tablet. Uh, where a teacher can walk around a classroom having a dashboard or can have uh, early warning systems uh, on their desktop, uh, same with administrators. So there are many sorts of data systems and technologies that can help support uh, the use of, uh, of data. Uh, so the question would be, uh, should a district uh, develop and maintain a high quality system? Absolutely. Uh, it needs to be done based on their needs. Uh, it needs to be linked to the types of data uh, that are uh, of interest in the school district uh, and uh, available to a wide range of audiences. And here you, you get a bit of a di digital divide. There are still parents uh, who don't have access to, uh, to look at uh, their, their children's data. So making uh, the data systems as accessible to the broadest possible audiences really, really important. Uh, and just uh, over the weekend, I saw something in uh, public media about making available, again, the digital divide of um, more broadband in schools and in libraries because these would be the sources where parents could come to look at their data. And we, we have sort of a funny one. And, and you're probably saying, why, did, why do parents need uh, information about their access and information about their, their children? Here's an example. In, in one school district where we worked, um, a parent had access and, and she got, a mother got on to look at her, uh, her child's schedule and found out that her son happened to have an 8 o'clock class. But the, the child had said, gee, mom, I don't have to be in school until 10 o'clock because I don't have classes before that. The kid was sort of hosed, lying to the parent, and he, had, you know, he would have skipped two classes. But the mother uh, was able to see what the uh, schedule was. Or students having access, um, you know, looking at their GPAs, looking at what they need to do, trying to find out uh, what their performance is relative to others. So uh, parents and students are really important in, um, 
having access to data systems. So another, um, actually, oops, we've got another poll coming up. So in terms of uh, your own districts, what kinds of data systems do you have? So what I'm seeing here is that people have a lot of different technologies. Um, you know, with smaller schools, there's always the question here about you know what is the most cost of, cost effective solution. And I'm looking at that um, over 58% have spreadsheets. And in some schools and districts, that may be the only thing you have because if you if you're a rural school district and you have only a small number of people. Uh, it may not be cost effective to have any of these really big um, systems like a data warehouse or a student information system. Uh, you know, the dashboards, uh, only about a third of the people are saying that they have dashboards. This is an emerging technology uh, and, and something that I think is going to have a big impact going forward, particularly with the proliferation of uh, early warning systems. Do we have any questions about the data systems that have, have come up? I just wanted to share the feedback from U.S. Virgin Islands. And they say that USBI has data warehouse, and, uh, and, they ha and St. Croix has a data dashboard. Um, some have handheld devices, and they also use spreadsheets. Good. Um, you know, it really is aligning your needs. You don't have to have too much technology. Uh, it's really about what systems will help you address your educational questions. And more and more technology providers are out there developing integrated systems where you can you know, sort of pick and choose uh, what components you want rather than stand alone. So this goes back to the question about the qualitative data uh, that was asked a, a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a pyramid that uh, the Using Data folks at Turk um, developed and uh, is in their Coach's Guide to Data Use. Uh, what you see uh, at, at the top of the pyramid are the summative assessments. Uh, and at the bottom, really, what goes on in the classroom. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because the stuff that's at the top are obviously necessary for accountability and compliance and can provide, uh, you know, particularly administrators, curriculum developers, with some level for curriculum planning. So you know, it's not that they're unuseful. Those data may be the most psychometrically valid uh, in terms of uh, things. But if you look at what at the base of the pyramid, the formative classroom assessments, the classroom activities, those are the ones that are going to give you the most bang for the buck in making um, instructional decisions. So. They may not be the most psychometrically valid, and people are saying, how do you validate formative uh, assessments, and, and the jury's still out on that. But those are the ones that are going to give you the most instructionally relevant uh, sources of data for step-by-step, moment-to-moment decisions in the classroom. I look at data as a continuum. Formative assessment data are the moment-to-moment -moment stuff, the immediate feedback loop uh, for a teacher and a student, and the State assessment data, uh, much longer term. People have called them autopsy data or dead on arrival data because if the test is given in March and a teacher doesn't get them until August or September when school reconvenes, uh, the data are certainly less useful then and, and students have changed. So to me, this is a helpful way of looking at uh, different sources of data, some qualitative, some quantitative, uh, and, uh, and thinking about uh, prioritizing how they can be used. And a question being, what does your data system uh, accommodate? Can, uh, can it accommodate uh, those formative cognitive assessments or the formative classroom assessments? And that goes to the question that uh, some uh, attendee uh, asked a little while ago. So here's the final recommendation. And this is about having students become their own data-driven decision makers. And as I said earlier on, much of the literature that supported this recommendation comes from the special ed uh, literature, 
special ed preparation has been doing this much longer than uh, in general education. Uh, this is about helping students understand the expectations and the criteria by which they're going to be judged. It's about providing feedback that is timely, specific, well formatted, and constructive for a student. And there's a whole big literature on, on feedback of, you know, uh, there's a gender issue there of, you know, what, uh, what teachers typically give male students as opposed to female students. But feedback is really, really important. The more specific and the more helpful and constructive and informative it is, the more the student is going to know what he or she needs to do as a next step to improve performance. Um, there are tools to help uh, students understand about feedback in the form of rubrics. And then using student analyses to help guide instruction. So if the student is understanding the interaction with the teacher about the data, will help guide a teacher in what to do to help remediate a learning deficit or capitalize on a learning strength. So it's really an interactive and iterative process with the student and getting them engaged as much as possible in the whole process because then they're taking responsibility and, uh, and ownership for their own learning through the use uh, and examination of data. So in terms of, of the whole cycle, you know, we, we talked about uh, feedback uh, in, in the past slide. You know, it needs to be tied explicitly to the criteria uh, that a teacher lays out for the teaching and learning process. It needs to be descriptive, not evaluative. You know, you, you're stupid, you can't get it, whatever. As helpful and, a, and as formative as possible about next steps uh, and prepare the student to do their own self-assessments about where they are uh, within their growth uh, cycle and trajectory of learning. And informative assessments also can help on this because the student is understanding through immediate feedback what, what is happening, where they are, uh, and what they need to do to move forward. So you know, sort of drawing uh, to a close of, the, um, of the, uh, the formal part of this, we've had a lot of questions, but let's really think about both from you know, in the weeds of what needs to be done and in the very high level um, about data. Happy to take any further questions. Uh, help you, you know, uh, I can lead you to various studies that may be of interest or uh, informative for you. I'd like to turn it over to you all to see what your feelings are, uh, feedback, uh, and how uh, the REL uh, and, uh, and whether you know, putting you in touch with experts um, whether they're professional development providers or literature, uh, happy to take any questions, further questions and uh, address them. Thank you, Ellen. So we've had a few questions and comments coming in as you've been speaking. Before we get to those, I just want to draw your attention to the link for the survey, um, a survey um, that you can share some feedback about how this event went for you. Um, and that's provided here. You can see that link. Um, you can click on it any time. We'll provide it again at the end of the presentation. So thank you so much for providing your feedback so that we can improve these, uh, these um, offerings for you in the future. So we had a question from Heather. Um, she notes that sometimes district leadership lacks the skills uh, to provide proper supports for their staff. Too often she's seen expectations for teachers to engage in data teams or collaborative inquiry as a directive, but the administrators have no idea what this should look like, so it ends up being a waste of time for teachers when they have so many other things on their plate. How would you address that? Heather, that's a great question, and it's, it's a really sticky one because, you know, you heard me say multiple times uh, in, the, in the past hour that leadership really is important. Um, the best thing, it, and, and again, you know, this, this shows how systemic this issue is, is through seeing other uh, leaders uh, modeling data and using data, through con uh, exposing them in conferences to the importance of this. Um, there's also the, uh, you know, the accountability factor. Uh, when somebody asked me a little while ago about what colleges of education are doing, we hate to talk about that an accountability hammer is going to come down and slam uh, schools of education, and this may be true of, um, of schools and districts as well, 
that there are going to be mandates out there, particularly um, when it comes to teachers being prepared to use data in the form of the EdTPA exam that comes out of Stanford uh, and the Plastics exam at, uh, and its successor out of Educational Testing Service, that teachers and administrate, teachers are going to have to demonstrate that they are able to use data or they won't, uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to come back and haunt them. Uh, ETS already has an administrative test that indicates, uh, that has a component of demonstrating uh, data literacy for administrators. So, you know, it, it's better that enlightenment happens, that they realize, wait a minute, we have to be evidence-based. We can't just work uh, in the same old, same old way. So uh, frank discussions, you know, if, if you're a teacher uh, uh, saying, you know, these are important. I need to be armed with data. We need the provision. Having frank discussions about these are sources that will help and having, um, you know, State Departments of Education are requiring this uh, now. More and more enlightened administrators are realizing this. A an example uh, is, uh, I'll give you two examples, one a district level and one a state level. Uh, Charlottesville Public Schools in Virginia, a new superintendent came in, dynamic woman, data-driven to the hilt. She had principals who didn't believe in data, and they didn't like what she was doing, and they, they, they left the district because they didn't like what she was doing. She hired principals uh, to lead the schools. That entire district has become a data-driven learning organization because of this woman's leadership. It, that was top-down. It's harder when it becomes a bottom-up effort, but teachers can affect change by having frank discussions. Another example, the Kentucky Department of Education. They had a revolving door of uh, chief state school officers. They then hired several years ago uh, a superintendent from North Carolina who became their chief state school officer. His name is Terry Holliday. They refer to him as Doc Holliday. And he has turned around uh, the state of Kentucky into one of the most data-driven states in the country. Um, so leadership makes a difference. The question is, you know, how do you go tell your superintendent, you know, this is important. We need a data system. We need these resources. You know, start with talking through with your building leadership and then working up the line. Um, there are more and more people who are getting this, and they're going to be left in, um, in the dust if, if they don't start uh, getting on the bandwagon. And you don't want to see it come through the hammer of accountability coming down on them. Thanks, Ellen. We have a question here from Maria. What are some examples of a high-quality data system? She mentions that that is one of their roadblocks. Uh, one of the things that I think IES doesn't like is to promote any sort of data system, specific vendors. Um, I think, again, uh, I'd be happy to have an offline discussion to, to at least uh, throw out some that are out there. Uh, but again, the, the answer to your, I, I don't want to say specific uh, systems because I don't want to promote one vendor or another. But you need to identify what your needs are, uh, whether it is uh, a warehouse, um, a tablet-based um, dashboard system, whether it's an assessment system, a man an instructional management system. Think about what the, the technology needs are based on your educational objectives and the data you have currently and the data that you still need that aren't currently in your data systems and then look at the potential vendors out there to see what aligns. And some, some are better about customizing, others not. But uh, I'd be more than happy to have an offline uh, discussion about my feelings of, of what are good and, and less good systems. Thanks. Question from Carol. What is a data dashboard? A data dashboard, if you think about it, it could be on your computer um, uh, desktop. It could be on a tablet. Uh, it is identifying, uh, and, and really, if you think about an early warning system, of what uh, students, as an example, might be most at risk of, uh, of failing or dropping out. Uh, literature says uh, that there are, are two main um, indicators. Uh, one is the number of failures in your freshman year in high school, another being uh, the number of absences you have in the freshman year as predictors. And, then, and early warning systems go even uh, further down now, that you have these data right on your desktop. 
so that if you're a teacher, you can look at your classroom and say, wait a minute, you know, Claire is at risk because she's been out for the last seven days out of 10. What's going on with her? Or she's at risk of failing um, X content area. And then trying to understand, based on those data, uh, what do I need to do to help remediate that problem? Uh, so it's, it's really based on the accumulation of new data and knowing based on research and theory um, what sort of indicators put a student at risk. So it's, it's a way of accumulating data that are really pointed to um, sort of topics that are most salient, like uh, graduation rate, um, uh, potential uh, dropout rates, things like that. Great, thank you. We have a comment from Heather that with so many online instructional platforms, assessment and progress monitoring systems and other systems, teachers are overwhelmed with the number of platforms that have data on students. And she says that their goal is to try to integrate all of the platforms into a one-stop shopping dashboard, but that's not an easy feat because all the vendors have different specifications and can't necessarily speak to all of the other systems in a seamless way. So without a lot of human resources in the area of data management, it's tough for districts to manage this. Uh, Heather's right. Uh, it is overwhelming. I can only hope that her, uh, her district uh, has some good technology people uh, that can help with that because it, you know, it really isn't the teacher's uh, responsibility of handling that. that. That should be at the technology department of uh, a school district to try and work some of that out. And having uh, the technology people talk to those who are in the trenches using the data to recognize that. Um, you know, again, uh, I think uh, you know, some of the work by Jeff Wayman uh, of Wayman Data Services uh, can really inform on this. But they're, they're, you're right, there's a proliferation of many systems and they're you know, all work. The, most, uh, you know, the, the real push most recently is integrated systems that are one-stop shopping. And uh, I, I'd urge districts to take a look at those because otherwise you're going to have several competing systems and legacy systems. Uh, and it's just going to be total chaos. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, we have a comment from Jane. The comment that feedback is often gender-based is intriguing. Any resources available related to this? Uh, I can go digging for them. I mean, this is old research back from like the 1980s and 1970s on attribution theory, where things like um, it, it's known that teachers tend to give um, males feedback on that they need to try harder because uh, um, uh, attempts uh, are malleable. So, gee, if, if uh, Peter can try harder, uh, you can succeed as opposed to something that's not malleable, like a teacher will say, you know, uh, to a female that, you know, you're, they, not that they say you're stupid, but the interpretation is that you know, no matter how much effort is put forth, you're not going to change it. So. Um, there was a whole um, uh, flow of research 30 years ago on the kinds of feedback that teachers need to be aware of so that you get out of the gender bias of just you know, telling um, little boys, you really need to try harder, and then you'll do better. Thanks. Question from Cindy. Do students examine their own data in the early grades also? There's no reason they can't. Uh, starting as early as possible uh, is helpful. Uh, my concern, uh, and I've had conversations with, uh, with colleagues about this, is what happens, uh, and, I, and I don't mean to, this to sound pejorative in any way, uh, but it goes to the self-regulation and the ability, the differential psychology literature is, if you have students who are less uh, lower in, in their skills, how does a teacher deal with them in, in helping to have them be their own data-driven decision makers. Obviously, if the special education people can do it, then I think pretty much everybody across the ability spectrum can do it, as well as younger children as well. You just have to make it as uh, understandable for a child as possible and put, their, put it in terminology that they'll understand and resonate toward. Thank you. Debbie wants to know where in Kentucky was the exemplary data-driven district that was mentioned. No, the district, the district was in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, the Kentucky example was um, the state uh, of Kentucky, the State Department of Education. 
Great, thank you. And we have a request, a request from Dana to share some reviews or papers regarding providing effective feedback to students. And I just wanted to note that we will provide additional materials um, on these topics that have been requested in the archive uh, link for this event. And so if you go back and check the archive um, over the next week or two, we will be providing additional information and resources. Claire, a question on that, because some of these are uh, pretty old, uh, as I said, uh, you know, tw uh, 30 years old. Uh, does the REL have the capability of uh, accessing? I can provide um, references to you if you can have somebody digging out uh, PDFs of these, as if they're available online. Uh, that would be ideal uh, because you know, many of these I had you know, in, in the dark ages before um, there was anything like a PDF. Yes, yes, we can, we can work on that, thanks. Okay. All right, we have just a few minutes left. Are there any other questions or comments that we would like Ellen to address? I just want to say, you know, data-driven decision-making is here to stay. Uh, it's hard. It's not the panacea. Uh, it's time-consuming. But it's worthwhile. You know, this is about helping all teachers help their, uh, their, their students learn. Uh, you know, again, you know, the caveat is that you know, we don't have as much hard data as we want on the impact. Uh, but again, it, it goes back to the statement of it shouldn't be an isolated event. Using data should be a fundamental part of what you do, uh, just like any other teaching resource uh, and strategy that you use. Good teachers have been doing this forever. They've been doing it in their brain. It's just that it's being recognized now and systematized and emphasized. And uh, to all you teachers out there that have been doing it, uh, hands off because uh, uh, you know, hats off to you all because it's hard. It really is hard. Great, thank you. We have a comment from Melissa. The students in the classroom tracking their own data are more aware of their progress and do seem to put more effort into their work. The teachers have shared this information with the other teachers in their grade levels. So I'm hoping to see the students tracking their own data in more classrooms soon. Perfect. Way to go, Melissa. Great. All right, I think those were all of the questions that we had. Thank you so much, Ellen. We are sharing again here the link to the survey. If everyone can please provide your feedback through this survey link. Any final comments? Thank you all for being here on a Monday uh, before a holiday weekend. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you. And uh, my um, contact information is on there. If you have any questions or if you need resources or uh, something that I can provide for you, please don't hesitate. I'm happy to try and help. Thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you so much to everyone who participated today. We really appreciate the great group that we had uh, in person, the US Virgin Islands, also across the US, um, uh, joining us virtually. And we have here uh, emails of Sandra Spado Santos, the facilitator of the US Virgin Islands Research Alliance. Also my email here and also the email from Ellen if you would like to follow up with her uh, personally. And thank you so much once again and hope that everyone will enjoy the rest of their day and their Thanksgiving week. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a happy Thanksgiving. Goodbye.